15. You'll find it on page 1048. And before we start, I'll pray. Our Father, please give us insight into your word this evening. Help us as we look at the actions and words of Jesus together to see the truths that you're teaching us. Amen. Well, this evening, we're looking at two of the most well-known stories that Jesus told. The stories of the lost sheep and the lost coin. They're parables, they're stories which are told using simple picture language, but to teach a profound message. Imagine a uh, countrywide, a countryside scene, the sheep are uh, grazing quietly while the shepherd snoozes. He opens one eye, he does uh, a quick head count of his flock. 97, 98, 99, hang on, there's one missing. So suddenly he's up on his feet looking around. He's off, climbing over fences. He's crashing through the undergrowth, he's wading through streams. And then he sees it, his lost sheep. The shepherd carefully picks it up, he puts it across his back, and he sets off for home. He's delighted, he's thrilled to have found his lost sheep. He can't keep the good news to himself, so he invites his friends around. And there's a party, probably a barbecue, and uh, everyone's happy, that's the last one. The second story is of a woman. We can picture her at home one evening. She's counting out her coins. Seven, eight, nine, wait. There's one missing. She gets up. She finds a lamp and lights it. Well, that's better. Now she can see to look. But the floor's a mess, so she takes her broom and starts sweeping around. Uh, it's no good, so she gets down on her hands and knees, hair dragging in the dirt, fingernails black. Suddenly she spots a glimmer amongst the dirt. What's that? Could it be? She claws at the ground and she picks out something. It's hard, it's round, and holding it up to the light, she blows away the dust. It's silver and it's shining. It's her lost coin. And now it's found. Still covered in dust, the woman runs to the next door house and the one after that. I've got it! Look what I found! Her friends gather round, everyone's smiling as they celebrate with her and all is well. They're great stories, aren't they? And at one level, they're, they're just so entertaining. But Jesus didn't tell these stories and others like it just for our entertainment. Luke didn't record what Jesus said in this structured and reliable account that we have here just to give us another children's bedtime story. Now, the parables of Jesus are there to teach us, just as Jesus used them to teach the first hearers 2,000 years ago. They're there to teach us significant and important truths about God. But if in uh, your head at the moment all you can picture are sheep and coins and, and shepherds and parties, well, that's fine. In fact, that's good, because if Jesus hadn't wanted us to have those illustrations, for that's what they are in mind, then he wouldn't have used them. But tonight, we'll need to let those illustrations, that picture language, draw us into understanding what Jesus is teaching. Luke sets the scene for us in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, by introducing us to the crowd that's gathered around Jesus. There's two groups there. Some were told are there to hear Jesus, good decision, but others, it seems, are distracted into grumbling about him. Have a look with me at verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Well, to eat with someone in Jesus' time was a sign of, of close association, a relationship, a mutual warmth. But the tax collectors, well, folk like them, they were at the bottom 
of the social food chain. You couldn't get much more unpopular than by gathering money from your fellow neighbours and passing it on to the Roman occupiers. And if you did it by means that weren't always honest, then that's going to make you doubly unpopular. The first group we see before Jesus are the socially bankrupt. But as well as that, spiritually bankrupt, having no relationship with God. Sinners, the word being used here as a derogatory term that Luke is quoting to mean the socially and the spiritually lost. But the Pharisees and the teachers, that's the other group, well, they were better than that, or so they thought. After all, they were the religious types. They were the observers of ceremony and ritual. They were marked out by religious zeal and further. They'd be at every prayer meeting, but perhaps only so they could look down their noses at those who weren't. That's the scene that we have in verses 1 and 2. That's the situation that confronts Jesus. One group looking down on another, and in doing so, showing their disdain towards Jesus. How can this Jesus possibly mix with people like that? Well, Jesus doesn't answer in the way the Pharisees might expect. He responds by telling three parables, three stories, three stories expertly crafted to reveal to the Pharisees their wrong thinking about God. Three stories expertly crafted to show them and to show us the truth about God that we need to know. Look with me at verses 3 and 4. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? What would you do if you were that shepherd character? says Jesus. What would you do if one of your flock went astray? Wouldn't you go after it? Well, there's a similar question in the second parable, verse 8. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? Well, the answer in both cases is, is obvious, isn't it? Yes, of course you would. Of course you'd go and seek out whatever it was that you've lost. There's no trick question here just as you or I might hunt for our car keys or look for the children's school shoes that's a popular game in my house we play it most mornings Um, just as it's reasonable to expect us to look for what we've lost it's just as reasonable that we expect God to seek out what is lost to him So our first heading for this evening is this. God seeks out those who are lost. God seeks out those who are lost. God isn't satisfied to have a world full of people that don't know him. God can't just watch as we turn our back on him, ignoring him, pretending he doesn't exist. Where there are people who are living outside of his kingdom, then God acts to deal with the sin that would otherwise leave us lost. And that clear and decisive action of God has already happened. God has sent Jesus, the son whom he loves, to reach out to us, to die in our place, taking the punishment for our sin, our rejection of God. Well, answering the Pharisees' question, why is Jesus welcoming sinners? And eating with them? Because that's what God does. He seeks out those who are lost. And this picture of Jesus around the dining table of the very people who God could choose to have nothing to do with, well, that's the picture of God himself seeking out those who need to be found. Look again at verse 4. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? 
Well, as we've seen, the obvious answer is yes, of course. But look again, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country? I know very little of shepherding. I know very little of many things. But it doesn't this sound like commercial suicide? If your sheep are your livelihood, if your sheep are as good as pound notes in the agricultural community of the day, then to leave 99 of them out in open country at the mercy of wolves and foxes and whatever else, to go after just one, well, does that not to you seem reckless? But our shepherd character here, our picture of God, our shepherd is so keen, so deliberate, so intentional and so purposeful and it's so urgent that the lost sheep is found that he's prepared to chance it with the other 99. That's kind of the kind of searching that's a picture of the way God seeks. God was prepared to sacrifice his firstborn and only son to suffer and die on a cross that you and I might be found forgiven, made free to live with God as if carried on his shoulders back home. That's how God seeks. Urgently, deliberately, intentionally. And looking back to verses 4 and 8, we'll see that God seeks relentlessly. Doesn't he leave the 99 and go after the lost sheep until he finds it. And in the case of our woman looking for the coin, does she not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? How does God search? God searches until he finds. Nineteenth of December, nineteen eighty one. There was a cargo ship. It was called the Union Star. You might know this story. It was on passage along the south coast of Cornwall. It was bound for a port in Arklow in Ireland, and on board were the captain. There were three members of his family, and there were four crew. The weather conditions that night were the worst recorded in that area before or since. The wind was blowing at 100 miles an hour. The waves were 60 feet high. That's probably the height of this building. The engines failed. They couldn't be restarted. The ship was adrift. The crew were helpless to stop the ship being washed closer and closer to the rocky coastline. Unaware of just how quickly that ship was drifting, the captain hadn't fully appreciated the trouble that he and his crew were in. Some 10 miles away, the Penley lifeboat was based a little fishing village in Cornwall called Mousel. The coxswain was contacted and he was asked to put to sea. The coxswain that night, you see, he knew the risks, he knew the cost that there might be in heading out to start that search and bring home the crew who could do nothing to save themselves. But nonetheless, he gathered seven men and that lifeboat launched into the worst weather ever known. Three other lifeboats were launched that night, well-equipped, purpose-built vessels, state-of-the-art with highly trained crew. One was badly damaged, and after a time, the three additional lifeboats had all turned back. A Royal Navy helicopter, the best that was available at the time, was tasked to join the search, but that too had to return to base. It just couldn't work in those conditions. The Union Star and her crew were helpless and alone, as was that lifeboat. I did not the lifeboat did that night. It kept going. It kept going deliberately, urgently, purposefully, and relentlessly. That cold winter's night, that crew searched, and they searched, and they searched again, until they found the lost and stricken ship. It's a remarkable picture, isn't it? it it's, it's a scene that uh, is kind of so overwhelming that we almost can't imagine it. 
But that's the kind of picture we need to have in mind if we're to come away from our time together this evening thinking rightly about God. You see, God's seeking out the lost, those who are lost to him. It's not some kind of half-hearted attempt such as we might make to find the toy that's fallen down the back of the chest of drawers or, or the loose change that's gone down the side of the sofa. The God who seeks, like the shepherd character and like the woman seeking after the coin in these stories, well, he seeks until he finds. Well, that's going to mean a number of things for us. It means that there's going to be no extent to which we might be lost away from a relationship with God that can take us beyond his reach. Just as there was no condition in which that Penley lifeboat wouldn't have searched until that ship, the Union Star, was found. If this is the way God seeks until he finds, then there's nowhere we can go where God is not able to work to restore us and to keep us in his loving care. It means there's no wrong attitude that we can have towards him that he can't correct in us. It means there's no tax collector type person, there's no sinner who cannot come by God's grace and his alone to call God Father for themselves. I wonder how that will motivate us. I suggest like this. In light of God's character, we can and we should be praying bold prayers. We should be relying on God's nature, as Jesus illustrated in these uh, picture stories for us here. It means that we can keep on asking God to act in the most unlikely of circumstances, to keep on searching where by rights we would have said there's no need. It means we can keep on asking God to show himself to, say, our elderly neighbour who has known nothing of God for 90 years. It means we can appeal to God that he'll seek out our children, our young people, whatever their age, that he might open their eyes to the Lord Jesus Christ. We can keep on praying for the husband or the wife who has heard the gospel again and again, but has still not taken it on board. We can keep on praying for our church and our vision, that as God's word is taught and understood rightly, that God seeks out and saves the lost and claims them for his own. Well, the search might take a short time, or it might take a while, so we'll need to be patient. But when God seeks out those who are lost, he searches until he finds What a freedom there is for the Christian, knowing that it's God who seeks us and not us who have to make ourselves attractive to him. What a blessing it is to know that there's nothing we can do to earn our way into God's presence. Just as that lost coin can't make itself found, it can't leap out from the dirt and say, here I am, find me, well, neither can we. I was recently asked why it was that I'd chosen to become a Christian. It's, it's a great question to be asked, and at the time, I'm not sure how helpful my answer was. But answering it now, I'd say that, well, I didn't choose to be a Christian. The God who sent Jesus Christ into the world chose me. And do you know the best bit? He chose me because he chose me. Simple as that. Because that's how God works. God, Jesus says, searches carefully, urgently, deliberately, relentlessly, and with purpose, seeking until he finds. That's our first heading for this evening. What we've seen so far is only half of the story. And as we look at what happens next in each of the two parables, we're going to see another important and related truth 
about God that Jesus is teaching. It's the second of our two headings, and it's this. God delights in those he has found. God delights in those he has found. Look back with me at verse 5. See what happens when that sheep is found. I'll read it again. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And the matter of the lost coin, well, that concludes similarly. Verse 9, and when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Lord God himself rejoices. I wonder if you've ever thought of that before. It's something that struck me as I was preparing these last few weeks that I haven't given perhaps enough attention to. The finder of the sheep and the coin, the picture of God finding and bringing home those he claims for his kingdom, he rejoices. And he's rejoicing to such an extent that it's, it's contagious. The rejoicing seems to go viral. The friends and the neighbours are called to join the celebration to rejoice with me, he says. I have found, that's verse 6, and again verse 9, rejoice with me. I have found. It's a kind of rejoicing. It doesn't seem very natural, does it, to our British way of celebrating. Oh, you've just got engaged. That's great news. Have an extra biscuit. Oh, a new baby. Oh, how marvellous. I must send a card. Even a wedding, even the way we celebrate, the great gift to us from God that is marriage. Well, the most we usually manage by way of celebration is a a meal and a disco, and then we all go home. But in God's rejoicing, there's none of this kind of British reserved holding back. This is Archimedes discovering for the first time that principle of density, and he's leaping out the bath, and he's running down the street, and he's shouting, Eureka! This is the classroom door being flung open, and the school child charging out, shouting and waving their certificate to anyone and everyone. That's the picture of the rejoicing that's going on here. Do you see that? What is it that God is rejoicing in? We need to be very clear about this. God rejoices in a busy church where there's uh, loads going on and the nice new building is full of people all the time. Is that why God rejoices, we're told in verse 7? Perhaps God rejoices when thousands of of Christians gather at a big national uh, convention and the music and the singing is is so good it'll blow your socks off. Is that what we're told about why God delights in verse 10? Well, have a look carefully with me because, because the Pharisees didn't get this and they were standing right in front of Jesus. And if they didn't get it, there's a chance we won't either. Verse 7 says this. God rejoices in one sinner who repents. And if you missed it, it's there again in verse 10. God rejoices in one sinner who repents. This emotion, this delight, this joy that we're invited to share is over one sinner. One single person who recognises their lostness before God and who God, by his grace, brings to repent, to turn to him for forgiveness. There's seven billion people on earth. It's on the internet, so it must be true. And uh, something like uh, 107 billion, apparently, who've ever lived. Quite how you get to that number, I've no idea. But I am just one in that number. And so are you. One in 107 billion. It's humbling, isn't it? But if you've been found, 
If you're one, just one, of those whom God has acted in, so that you know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, then God himself rejoices. Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. Rejoice with me, I have found my lost... Try, try this, try putting your own name there. See if it fits. Rejoice with me, I have found my lost David. Rejoice with me, I found my lost Susan, my lost Kevin, my lost Rachel, my lost Ahmed, my lost Sarah, my lost Jean-Claude, my lost Jennifer, my lost Derek, my lost Yasmin, whatever it is. If your name fits, if you can say that you were once lost, but now you are found, then God delights and rejoices in finding you. One out of billions. God delights in those he has found. And what makes God rejoice isn't flashy or showy. What God delights in isn't necessarily dramatic or, or even visible to us at all. After all, the person who's quietly following Jesus Christ will look rather like the person who's not. The person who sits at the, the back of a church one Sunday, who, who takes away a helpful leaflet like this one for Remembrance Day, who reads it and asks to be forgiven. Well, that one person will be the cause of more rejoicing in heaven than over 99 who read it and throw it away. That's what verse 7 says. There will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who don't need to repent. We aren't told that God rejoices in a busy church diary with activities that fill every part of the day, good though that is. We aren't told that God rejoices in a church that's blessed with a willing and capable staff and lots of active members who work so hard amongst us who are always busy. Very good though that is. But we're told from the parables spoken by Jesus that God rejoices more in a single person being found and brought into a right relationship with him than in any number who might trust in their busyness, in their giving, or in their serving, but have not come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. Knowing what makes God rejoice has to make us take stock of what we value, doesn't it? Doesn't it make us ask ourselves the question, do we rejoice with him? Or do we rejoice in something else? Does the Christian life, as we know it, cause us joy at all? I hope it does. If we know what delights God, then we will, I hope, truly value gospel work. That is, we'll choose to direct our time, our money, our energy, our effort towards activities that are aimed at seeing people come to trust in Jesus first and foremost. God delights in solving for us our greatest problem. It's not poverty, it's not illness, it's not bereavement, it's not violence, it's not anger, it's not even war. God delights to solve our greatest problem, that is sin and the separation from him that it causes. God delights to break down that separation and to overcome our lostness. God delights to find us and to bring us home. I hope you'll go to bed counting sheep tonight and when you get to 99 don't forget the one that went missing but was found remember our God who seeks out those who are lost 
when you're buying your bus ticket tomorrow or collecting your change in a shop, remember the coin that was lost but found and be reminded of what delights God. Remember our God who delights in those he has found. Let's take a moment to reflect on what we've seen from these words of Jesus this evening, and then I'll pray. Our Father, we thank you for your good nature, that you will seek out those who are lost. And we thank you that you delight in those who you find. Please help us to delight in what delights you as we long for your kingdom to grow. And we ask this in Jesus' name.